everybody and welcome back or welcome for the first time to the Choose to Think Inspirational podcast. I'm so grateful that you're tuning in on my YouTube channel, the Choose to Think channel here on YouTube, or you may just be listening to the podcast on your favorite platform. So if you could do a tiny favor and just say, hey, I'm here, let me know, uh, subscribe to the show, put a big thumbs up by it, it would be so appreciated. I love that so much. So welcome. And I want to tell you about a gal named Idel Corey. And she recently wrote a book about her humble beginnings, her rise to success, and finding a relationship with the Lord. Here's a little bit more about Idel. She began her life in the projects of New Mexico and went on to build a career on Capitol Hill. She met a U.S. president and she became a state James Madison Fellow. We talk a little bit about that in the show. She's a former high school advanced placement history teacher and adjunct professor of U.S. history. She's also was, was nominated Walmart Teacher of the Year. I guess she won that particular accolade or award. In 96, she and her students were the first ever recipients of the South Carolina Order of the Silver Crescent. And she also worked for U.S. Senator Harrison Schmidt, who was a former Apollo 17 astronaut, and Congressman Herman Badillo, the first Puerto Rican congressman. Now, she wrote a memoir, and a memoir, I have a hard time saying that word, memoir, and her, this particular book is really the subject of our show today, but I'm going to tell you it so much more because we just had a candid conversation basically about her faith. And as a staunch Catholic, how things changed for her when she actually met the Lord. And we even get into a little bit of what all of that meant. But I want I want you to listen to this about her, her book called I Baby. And it starts out like this. How does a poor Hispanic girl living in the projects of New Mexico grow up to work on Capitol Hill, meet a U.S. president, and become a state James Madison fellow? How does that happen? Well... Idel Corey can tell you how through the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the answer. That's the answer. Idel, lovingly nicknamed I Baby by her father, had an unstable childhood with a father who would disappear for long periods of time and a mother whose methods of coping to deal with her painful past were the only way she knew to deal with her pain. But God had his hand on Idel, whether she was in foster care or seeking refuge in one of her half-siblings' home. Now, I will give you a little disclaimer that some of the topics on the show today may not be suitable for children, so please use viewer or listening discretion. Because of her passion for education and her brilliant mind, Idel received the opportunity to work on Capitol Hill. While she pursued a career in shaping our nation's educational system, someone was pursuing her and she had no idea until she found him and her whole world changed. As you journey with Idell from New Mexico to DC, to California, to South Carolina, you will discover the value of surrendering control and allowing God to direct your path. Can I get an amen for that? Whether you're a young college student and you're like, oh Lord, what are you going to do with my life? All the way to maybe you're in midlife, maybe you're a great grandmother and anywhere in between. Isn't it a beautiful thing just to say we're resigned, Lord, we're surrendered, Lord, we want you to take over and guide our path. And that's really what you're going to see that she has done in her life. You will encounter the redeeming power of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And you will see how God really is a good father because he always takes care of his children, even his eye baby. So I want you to make sure that you stay tuned for the entire episode because at the end, we she she gives just a, Idell gives such a proclamation of, really what it takes to become a Christian, what it takes to surrender your life to God. She also will encourage you to pursue God with everything that's in you. And we know that the word says that when we do seek God and when we seek him with all our mind, all our heart, all our strength, all our soul, that there's a reward for that and that we will indeed meet him. Idell really underscores or emphasize the 
truthfulness of the Bible and how we talk a lot about thoughts, but how we need to filter everything we're thinking, every agenda, whether it's a political agenda, something culturally that's going on, we need to filter everything through the lens of the Bible. You and I know that the Bible is living and active. It's so sharp and it penetrates deep down. And so we want to use the Bible as our tool, as our guide. It's an, like a navigational guide, isn't it, on how we conduct our business and how we live our life. Idell is delightful. She has a smile on her face. She seems to be such a beautiful spirit, a beautiful individual. And, and I want you to get her book to support her ministry and her initiative. And I think you're going to be so richly blessed. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Idell. Welcome, Idell, to the show. We're so glad to have you on the Choose to Think Inspirational podcast. I love your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Choose to Think. I tell all my students to think. We are what we think we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are. And the truth is in the Word of God. And I've compared the Word of God with um pop psychology and the word of God is true. Yeah. God is love and he forget and he forgives us and we forgive others and we have <laughs> we have peace and joy mm -hmm. in our life when we have that. So mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. I filtered everything through the word. Yeah, you know, Idell, I often say also that because you and I both love psychology and I kind of geek out on neuroscience. And I always say that finally science has caught up with the Bible because even when we're talking about like taking thoughts captive and being transformed through the re being, you know, being, let's see, be the transformed through the renewing of your mind. Your mind. It's yeah. like, you know, we know now science will tell us that we can actually change our moods, our emotions, our behavior, just by what we think. And it's like, okay, well, the Bible has been saying that for a long time. So science is finally catching up. <laughs> That's how I feel. I feel that science is finally catching up. A science didn't um, identify the Hittites mm -hmm. until the 20th, the turn of the 20th century. And then uh, they said, oh, by the way, there was an ancient civilization called the Hittites. Yeah. Uriah right. was Hittite. Uriah, the one that was killed with he, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, King and, David, and uh, Abraham. Mm -hmm. He had a Hittite grave, and the Bible told us that a long time ago. And now science is catching up. That's right. Uh, you, yeah, completely. I love it. Well, I I want to just kind of. First of all, before we go into your book, which I can't wait to talk about your book, I Baby, but tell us a little bit about you personally, your background, how you came to know the Lord, and just catch us up in a in a little nutshell, if you don't mind. Okay. Ooh, it's not a little nutshell. <laughs> I know. That's why I said that. I'm I like, can she do it? <laughs> I grew up in New Mexico. Okay. I'm from Albuquerque and Las Cruces and I'm Hispanic. I consider myself Hispanic because I grew up in New Mexico and I worked on the Hill. I worked for a U.S. Senator uh, Harrison Schmidt. He was with Apollo 17. He was the uh, last mission to the moon and he gave me away my wedding to, to my husband Tony and um, I found the Lord first. I went to a Billy Graham crusade with a Catholic friend in New Mexico. He had a crusade in the 70s and I went to them and I went to the crusade and I said, all these people going forward are not Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> they're all going to hell and they're not Catholic. And I was a very good Catholic. I kept the holy days of obligation. I genuflected. I went to the priest, even though my family didn't go, I went. I was a very good Catholic, but I didn't know the Lord. 
So fast forward, God sent me to Washington, D.C. and to work on the Hill. I worked for uh, the senator from New Mexico mm -hmm. and um, I found the Lord there. I had a vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I told a lot of people about that, that I had a vision and nobody on the Hill in the senator's office, believe me, they mm -hmm. said, sure you did, sure you did. And I said, yeah, that's what Billy Graham said. If you seek God and you uh, pursue him, he will come into your life. And they said, sure, sure. <laughs> Nobody believed me until I met my husband on a blind date. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was a blind date, and they were uh, friends that he grew up with. And Mike uh, De Maria was something, somebody he grew up with in Pennsylvania. And Clara, I worked with Clara on the Hill, and she was from New Mexico. And uh, I met Tony <laughs> on the Hill, and I told him about my vision, and I said you believe in Jesus? And he said, yeah, I saw a button that he had on his console. Mm -hmm. uh, and during our blind date, I invited him and Clara and Mike to a, a party on the hill. And, um, and then he said, yes, I'm born again. And I said, I think I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, like, oh, that's what Billy Graham said. <laughs> you can know God personally. And I think God came to my room last night. Wow. I was living alone in downtown DC on 7th Street. And um, I had a vision. I'm sorry, I did. But I told a lot of people about that. And um, they didn't believe me. <laughs> well, do you so want to share your vision? Do you want to share it or is it too personal? No. Yeah, I I saw light. I mm -hmm. saw light in the corner of my room. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's you guys. <laughs> you do come into people's life. And uh, I went to sleep knowing that God came into my life. Wow. I, I don't know if it was... Um, it was God, Jesus, or an angel. I don't know, but there was a light. There was an effervescent light in my room. And at first, I thought it was uh, something, a light from outside. And I stood up and I went to look and there was nothing. There was nobody mm -hmm. outside. There was no light um, shining in my room and it was still there. And it was like, it was a vision. <laughs> yeah, and you weren't afraid. It sounds like no, you weren't afraid. Yeah. No, I, I had peace. I had mm. peace. I thought that that's how God came into your life. I went on the hill. I, uh, I went every day to work mm -hmm. and I came home and I pursued God. I pursued him for weeks. And I said, I'm a testimony of God's grace that he didn't strike me down <laughs> because I went to work and I came home and I read the word and it was gobbledygook. Mm. I didn't understand the word. It wasn't a reveal to me. And I started in Genesis and I said, it doesn't make sense to me all of it but i'm gonna stay on my quest <laughs> and then he came into my life mm. and uh he met me and i thought it was him i know i know now that it was him mm. yeah. yeah you know so, those kinds of testimonies are so powerful and they're so meaningful they're deeply personal in the sense that it's somewhat hard to explain to other people that phenomenon that exactly what happens that moment that we accept Christ as our savior and you know it's I mean I, I think it's delightful that God sometimes reveals himself in really almost miraculous ways even my own personal revelation of Christ was almost a 
physical sensation and a warmth kind of, I mean, that's as close as I could get to describing it really, yeah. but it was life changing from that moment forward. And the next day I was really a different person with different values and really yeah. on fire for like you were for seeking the Lord, because God is true to his word in that when we seek him, he says that we, and we've got to seek him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, that he will indeed reveal himself to us. So what a beautiful, Amen. yeah, what a beautiful then, picture. I met my husband on a blind date right after that. Yeah. His mom was praying that God would send somebody into his life wow. and met on a blind date. I didn't like him at first. <laughs> he called me again and uh, he pursued me. And then he asked me to go to his uh, church. That was the first official date that he asked me to, to attend. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked me to go to his church. And I thought they were nuts. I said, <laughs> you're nuts. You're, you're crazy. You don't genuflect. You don't pray to God out loud. You, pr you don't pray the rosary. Oh, <laughs> you <laughs> and I left. And I said, he's part of a cult. I didn't believe him. I was very Catholic. I went to Catholic school and he did too. And his mom was praying at home. And she mm -hmm. said, you need to send somebody who's strong. <laughs> and the joy of the Lord is my strength. I know that. Mm -hmm. And um so uh, I met him and I left his church and I said, I'm not going to be part of that cult. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the Catholic church. And, and then he kept calling me and calling me and calling me. And I went back. I, part of me could not be a quitter. Yeah, I didn't quit anything. So um, I went back to his church and I heard the message that Billy Graham preached and he identified me as a sinner mm. and that I needed to repent of my sins. And I went running down several times. It was, mm. I don't know, three or four times <laughs> I went running down and they told me, you don't have to come down. <laughs> You're confessing to a priest and um i went i got saved i was saved during the uh jesus revolution yes uh, the jesus people there's a movie out yeah it's i saw it yeah. jesus revolution and i was saved during that period of time it started in a basement in I think it was uh, Washington, D.C. on Connecticut Avenue. Maybe it was Maryland, but it started in a basement and then it it blew up mm -hmm. and we were caught in that revival in wow. Washington, D.C. My wow. husband, <laughs> my husband and Tony and I were caught in their revival. Wow. Isn't God good in the way he works? And thank goodness for the persistence of your you know, your, I guess your boyfriend to be, or, you know, <laughs> at, at that moment, he didn't give up, did he? That was wonderful. He didn't give up. And he knew, <laughs> he knew before I did yes. that um, I was going to be his wife and that his mom, uh, his mom's prayers were going to be answered. Mm. And he said, I don't have to look anymore. God's going to send me a wife. So when he asked me to marry him, I was quiet. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. He was asking me to marry him. And uh, he knew it before I did. So did did you say nothing? You were really quiet? I, or I said you... nothing. I was in <laughs> shock. <laughs> oh, his, stepdad, his stepdad was in the other room. And he said, what if she says no? You're not going <laughs> to ask her before. And uh, he said, I'll just return the ring. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I was saved uh, and he invited me to his church and then he knew 
that mm. I was the right person. We've been married 45 years. So oh, I congratulations. Was, that's <laughs> that's wonderful. What a powerful love story too. What a sweet, sweet love story that is. And so jump a little bit, maybe fast forward. And here you are after all these years of being married, all the many adventures you've had in your life. And you decide one day, like, okay, I'm going to sit down and write my memoir. How did that go? How did you even decide to, well, to write your book? I wrote it uh, when I, we lived in Spartanburg. And um, I talked to my mom. And she said, don't write your book until after I'm with the Lord. And uh, I dedicated my book to my mom. She died last year. Yeah, yeah show it. Yeah, I saw that. She died the... last year. And Lovely. She almost 101. And she was 100 years old when she died in June last year. Mm. And... Um, and she asked me not to uh, write, finish, not to publish my book until she was with the Lord because it had too many painful memories. So I honored her and I didn't publish it till she was uh, with the Lord. She died last year. Oh, and so um, sorry. Yeah. And she was a beautiful person. She was raised. Um, her mom was institutionalized uh, mm -hmm. with epilepsy and she was raised by her, her father and he worked at a wood yard in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Broadway. And she was an adulteress and uh, an alcoholic. And I found out after my dad died uh, I found out why she did that. She was gang raped by her mm -hmm. cousins. They would come down the stairs and rape her every single night. And mm -hmm. she told me that she never revealed that to anybody. And mm -hmm. she told me why she did what she did. And she said, it's too painful to remember that my kids were taken from me and we were placed in foster home. Uh, you said you read part of my book. My the dear. Little Red Wagon is my sister, Linda. She took me to the hospital. I was dying and my mom wasn't there and uh, I was dying. And uh, my sister said, I can't let her die. And she was, I think she was, I don't know, 12 or 13. And mm -hmm. uh, she said, I cannot let my sister die. So she carried me, she pulled me to the hospital in Las Cruces. And the doctor looked at me and he said, you're on your deathbed. You're almost dead. And um, then he said, he called the social services and he said, these girls need to be taken away from that woman and they need to be placed in a foster home. So he, he, they did, did exactly what he said. And they took us away from my mom and she didn't know anything. She didn't know where we went. She didn't know foster home or anything. And um, my dad, I don't know if you know my dad, my story about my dad, but it's called iBaby. Yes. Tell us about that. Okay. Well, my mom told me all this, that she was gang raped after my dad died. My dad left us. My dad, um, he could not handle adultery. And my mom had lovers come in the house. And I saw a lot that I shouldn't have seen as a child. And um, Bolo and Badu were two of her friends that came to our house. And I didn't accept them because they weren't my dad. And my atheist dad and alcoholic and adulterous mom, they loved me. 
<laughs> they love me. I know that love covers a multitude of sins. And I learned love from my parents. And um, anyway, so uh, my mom took us, uh, she, she said, uh, I'm going to tell you the story. And after my dad died, my dad had open heart surgery. And my dad was dying and he called my mom and he said, I need to come home to Albuquerque. And he had left. He couldn't stand her adultery. He had left. And on one of his trips, I don't know where he was, but um, he left and he came back. And my mom was a beautiful, beautiful person. She was kind and she was giving and forgiving. And um, she took him back. And then my, she went to the store. He was living at her house, at her apartment. And um, she went to the store. And three evangelists came to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they said, um, God told us to come here. <laughs> and God told us that there's a very sick man living across the street. They knocked on the door and uh, they came into, they came to my house, my mom's house. And um, they said, we have to be obedient to God. And my dad said, no, you can't come in. I'm very sick. And they argued with them and they said we have to and he said no and they said yes and they said I recorded them and they said um, that God told them to come there and to minister to a guy that was very sick and my mom came back from the store and my dad was on his knees and had his hands up surrendering to God and he died mm. that night wow. he died. yeah he died at 2 a.m that night and God heard my prayer I prayed that uh my dad wouldn't be taken until he saw the he surrendered to God and he didn't he wasn't taken until he surrendered mm. so I see him again wow. <laughs> and oh. then after the funeral is when my mom told me the story. She hadn't told anybody the story about her her cousins mm -hmm. and um, they raped her. And mm -hmm. she didn't know how to relate to a man, but she never had anything mean to say about my dad, mm -hmm. ever. Oh, that is so sweet. You know, as you were talking, Idell, I was... I was wondering just you personally, I mean, here you are a young gal and you really convert essentially from Catholic tradition, we can say, or religion, I guess, and are born again Christian at, at one point, meeting Jesus and suddenly your life changes. How did that impact your family though? Were, how did they respond to your quote unquote conversion or the changes that they may have seen in you were they how were they impacted my sister <laughs> that saved my life she said you're gonna leave the catholic church and i said yeah i'm gonna i'm going to focus my relationship on god alone not tradition not rules on god alone and she didn't come to my wedding <laughs> and uh, she said the Catholic church taught you a lot. They taught you to uh, gaze upon God and follow the rules. And she's right. I realize now I was, I was angry at the church because I was a good Catholic. I kept all the rules. I kept all of them, but I had never read the Bible. I mm. didn't know anything about God. And I didn't know who he was. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. And I kept all the rules. I was a good Catholic girl. 
Mm -hmm. I kept all the rules. I followed them. I went to confession and I said my sins before priest. I said my novenas. <laughs> I was a good Catholic. I kept the rules. And I was mad at the Catholic Church at first. And then my sister reasoned with me and she said, the Catholic Church taught you a lot. Mm -hmm. And my mom stayed in the church. She made rosaries till she died. Uh, mm -hmm. Before she died, she stopped. And um, and uh, the Catholic Church was uh, very instrumental in my life. Mm -hmm. And it pointed me, my sister was right. My sister Linda was right. It pointed me to God. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a God. Mm -hmm. I knew that. And how, how would you describe your relationship with Jesus, the relationship that you have with, with Christ? How was that different from your experience, though, growing up as a Catholic? I kept the rules. Mm -hmm. Now God speaks to me directly. I don't have to go to a priest. Mm -hmm. He is my priest. And mm -hmm. he speaks to me all the time. Mm -hmm. How does he speak to you? Like he through his word and through his, prayer? Everything has to filter through his word. Mm -hmm. And um, I test everything. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I filter it through his word. Is that really you? But he speaks to me in dreams and visions. And he guides and directs my life. When I submitted to Billy Graham. <laughs> no, I didn't submit. I listened to Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And, and then he, God sent me to Washington, DC. And I know, I know that I know that uh, God was answering Emmy's prayer. Um, she is uh, my husband's mom. And he speaks to me frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, my book chronicles his uh, speaking to me and I check everything mm -hmm. through the word. Is that really you, God? Is that you? My husband sent me something um, this morning. He said, God woke me up last night and he, he gave me this word. And, um, and uh, it says, you talk about the uh, the overriding um, the overview of iBaby and how the Lord has been constantly faithful to you. He has even through even though there were valleys in my life, the Lord was faithful to me, and He was. Mm -hmm. And if you read my book, you're you'll find out how he used my influence uh, on the hill and I was a James Madison fellow I don't know if you know that but I, they choose one history teacher first per state and I've received a lot of awards mm -hmm. and God did that I know he did that he raised Moses in Pharaoh's home when, and he was trained by, by the Egyptians and he was trained and he knew what to do, when to do it. And he was well-trained and not that I'm comparing myself to Moses, sure. but uh, he, he uh, was trained in the world, in the world that was the Egyptian way. And I was trained in the world. Um, I went to UNM uh, and uh, God used Mr. Herring, who <laughs> contradicted my high school uh, guidance counselor. And my high school guidance counselor said he was Hispanic. And he said, Hispanic women get married and have babies. They don't go to college. And I said, okay nobody in my family had gone my dad was gone at this point and I said okay I like school I like college I like that but I'm gonna okay I'm gonna honor you 
and uh, he God used a secular guy. I don't know where Joseph Herring is today, but uh, he said, oh, that's not true. I'm going to find a college for you. And uh, he said, what do you make on the SAT and the ACT? And I said, oh, I haven't taken them. <laughs> I'm working here because I want to buy a car. And uh, God used Mr. Herring to direct me and take me to take the college entrance exam and he found a federal program and uh, and then fast forward I got the James Madison Memorial Fellow mm -hmm. you have to be politically involved and uh, you have to be you have to commit to um, to teach uh, about the U.S. Constitution in high school and so I did, and I won. <laughs> Aww, that's amazing. That is amazing. Well, I, I love what your husband wrote, for one thing. What an encouraging note. It's so nice to be married to a godly man. And even just to hear your story about his persistence and, and, and being married for so long, it sounds just really beautiful. And I know there were some valleys. I, I don't doubt that one bit. But as we kind of discuss your book just a little bit more, Idell. What was the motivation for writing that book? I know your mama said, hey, just make sure that's published after after I'm gone. And, you know, having disclosed a lot of important or personal information to you. But what before that even just one day you decide I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write me a memoir or how did that happen? Well, I wanted to tell the true story about my dad. Okay. There, there's a lot of people that wonder about him. He was a convict. And I said, mm. yeah, he could have been all those things. He left us. And he was a bigamist. I, I don't know. All I know is that he loved me. And I was his eye baby. And I know that. And I know my mom uh, loved us and she loved me and she would never place me in a foster home. So there's a lot of people that uh, don't like my mom <laughs> because they said um, she allowed you to go to a foster home and she didn't allow, we were taken. And I realized why she did what she did why she was an adulteress and alcoholic. And um, that's where I said a lot of psychology went into this. I thought, I thought about things and I said, mm, that's true. That's true. My mom's motivation and her hurt from being, from trusting her cousins, um, she uh, became an alcohol, alcoholic and an adulteress, adulteress. And my dad was an atheist, but he sent his three girls to Catholic school. He wanted the best education for us. And he was a dad. So my motivation was to tell the true story about my parents. There's a lot of people that don't understand uh, my mom and my dad. And um, that's why I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. And I love how you said that love covers over a multitude of sin. And what I also hear you saying, Idell, is that, yes, they were your parents and you wanted to honor them. But at a certain point in your life, you also saw them as just fallible human beings, God's creatures, nevertheless susceptible to making really poor choices. But instead of blaming them, holding resentment and bitterness in your heart, you kind of unearthed a little bit of why they may have behaved the way they did, why they made decisions that they made. And suddenly when anyone really does that, we, we become so much more empathetic to those people who maybe they made our lives harder in a way, but yet there's always another side of the coin, isn't there? There's always another perspective that we may not have. And I think that's why God, you know, he's clear about 
not not judging, certainly not based on appearances, but also maybe just to hold our tongue sometimes because who's going to throw or cast the first stone? And so what a wonderful tribute even to your parents that you've done as you've said, I love them and I love them dearly. And here's something about them that you may not have known. And you just kind of open the door a little bit to uh, uh, a different approach and a different angle on, on your parents. So that's really beautiful. You know what? The word says that we're all sinners. Yes. And uh, I told my mom, when we didn't get, did not change from our pajamas for two or three days, I think it was three, but she told me everything. And I said, oh, that's why we were in the foster home. That's why you were an adulteress. And I told her the story about Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, she was a prostitute. She was, uh, she sold her body uh, to the highest bidder and uh, God forgave her. And he told the religious, you have, who have no sin at all, you cast first stone. And I told her a lot of stories that I had learned from the Bible, but I have to say this before I was saved, I resented them. I resented my mom and my dad. I won for queen twice and um, and my dad wasn't there. My mom wasn't there. Mm. Uh, I won for uh, the second in the state of New Mexico. Um, I wrote a manual and there was nobody there to clap and nobody was there. Mm. And I resented them at first and then i found the lord and i said oh we just have to confess admit confess and turn from our sin god told, god told mary magdalene go and sin no more right. and he told the woman at the well go and sin no more and we have to do that we have to embrace his forgiveness to give us joy and don't sin anymore. If you com complete, you uh, keep sinning, then you're not born again or you're not obedient. Mm. Both of those things are wrong. Mm. And so we need to be obedient and we need to obey him and be born again mm. and transform our minds. <laughs> we have to... That's why when it, it, to education, there's so much untruth mm -hmm. that's being taught right now. It's awful. Mm -hmm. And I went into education. I taught U.S. history and the U.S. Constitution for years and years. And I said, you know what? Bad ideas. I'm a victim of bad ideas. Yeah. My atheist dad and my alcoholic and adulterous mom had bad ideas. Yeah. We were deceived. And Satan is alive and well. He's like a roaring lion. And mm -hmm. uh, he wants to deceive and capture people. Mm -hmm. And he does. He teaches us lies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're lies. That's right. And Anyway. Yeah, my goodness. Go <laughs> yeah, so good. And I, I guess as we're closing out also, Idell, and thank you so much for sharing all of these wonderful messages and reminders that we we're we can be born again, but we may make mistakes even after the fact. Mm -hmm. But as long as we're repentant or turning to God again, there there is still hope and we're not just washouts, but if we are not careful we can believe the accuser and the enemy of our soul. And we have to be so vigilant against his attacks and how he masquerades in our lives and just set our hearts and our minds like Flint to toward God. But kind of easier said than done sometimes. It's really a discipline, I think. I know it is in my life anyway. I really do have to choose to think. 
And I'm very deliberate about that. Most days, sometimes I get a little bit off and maybe I partner with the enemy of my soul instead of resist those, those lies and accusations and so forth. But I'm thinking about your book. And as we kind of close out here, what are you hoping that the reader would take away after reading your book? What, what lesson or what kind of inspiration do you think they'll be left with? I think they'll be left with hope. And we have a glorious hope in the future. I know I'm going to see my adulterous and alcoholic mom and my atheist dad in heaven Mm. because they confessed and surrendered to God. And God transforms our mind. And um, he he's real. I'm sorry. He's real. (laughs) That's what I want the reader to take from my uh, book that God is real and he speaks through his word. We, we are going to mess up. David, who (laughs) he was after God's own heart and he messed up and there's consequences and we need to accept those consequences, but we don't have to go to a priest and we don't have to go to a high priest. We can confess, acknowledge confess and turn and just every day just say I'm gonna be a better person I'm gonna be conformed to its likeness and um recently (laughs) my friend said you need to just submit don't don't be so strong and I said okay God is just And he punished the Israelites when they saw God work and when he delivered them, he, he, they saw God work and then they worshiped the golden calf. And I said, how can they do that? And God said, you can do the same thing. You can see me work and you can worship gold and money and root of all types of evil the love of money is the root of all types of evil and um i want the readers to know there's a real god and if you seek him he will come into your life and give you hope i don't fear death i don't Uh, people say why don't you fear death and i said i don't but i don't give in to the lies of the devil yeah. He said, he said, don't understand God is just and God punishes evil. He does that. And uh, Jael, <laughs> she uh, drove a peg <laughs> into Cicero's head. Yeah. And, and um, yet she was called by God. She was one of the people and Rahab told a lie. Mm-hmm. And she was called by God. You need to take everything and filter it through the word of God. Mm-hmm. And don't believe what people say. Mm-hmm. You take it through, uh, you filter it through the word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Idell, for coming on thank the show you. and for sharing thank your story. You for having this podcast. It's yeah. wonderful. Well, we appreciate you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Mm -hmm.